Bienvenidos, bienvenidas a todos. Welcome, everyone, to the faculty, to the staff, to the community members. We're very glad to have you here. To our visitors from System, thank you for being here. And most of all, to our chancellor. I get the privilege of introducing him yet again. It's easy to talk about him as a surgeon, as the first person to take a liver, divide it in half, and save two babies' lives. But as he was telling the students just a little while ago, education saves lives. What he has done for us here in the Valley in helping us create this new university, in helping us bring a medical school here, in helping us rethink education in the Valley, in helping us save lives is tremendous. He is a friend of the Valley. He is a friend of Pan Am. He's a friend of UT Brownsville. He is our chancellor. And it is a great honor and a privilege to ask him to come up and speak to you. He will speak for a little while, and then you get to ask questions and you get to give feedback. And he wants to hear that feedback, and he wants to hear your questions. A great man, con un corazón grande, with a big heart, Chancellor Sigueroa. President Nelson, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, let me just, before I start, just give you a special congratulations. I understand you're being recognized by uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Edinburgh and felicidades for all the great work that you do. Let's give it applause. I uh, would also, uh, before giving any comments that I've got is I want to recognize our uh, elected officials who are here and um, our regent, uh, Ernie Alisada. It is absolutely fantastic to have representation at the table you know, of the Board of Regents you know, with representation from the Rio Grande Valley, especially when we're embarking upon such transformation initiatives. And so I want to salute uh, Regent Alisada. Thank you very much. And then at the end of the day, our universities aren't universities uh, without you know, our remarkable faculty and our staff and the students we try to inspire uh, to be the next leaders. And I can't thank the faculty enough you know, for your remarkable work that you do every day, even in a time of great change. Uh, fundamentally, you're focused on providing the best education to our students. You're focused on helping us embark upon this new journey. And you still never turn your back on what's the most important thing to do, which is really open opportunities for our students. So I want to applaud you. What, what I'd like to accomplish today is, you know, really not provide, you know, any scripted lecture. Uh, what I'd like to do is, and not even really kind of catch you up to date as to, you know, how we got here. I think you know that. Uh, what I'd like to do is to give you the most current update that I have. And then really, I want to have the opportunity to listen to you, issues that are on your minds. And, and then to the best of my abilities, answer questions. And I'm not going to tell you I know the answers to all the questions, uh, but the, qu the answers that I do know, I will say, and the ones that I do not know, you know, we will look into. So um, a couple of things since I was last here uh, during the signing ceremony uh, when Rick Perry was here signing Senate Bill 24. Um, since that time, we have hired Dr. Julio Leon, who, who many of you met. In fact, I saw you on YouTube as you were in this auditorium 
speaking to the faculty. Uh, I think another important aspect uh, that has been accomplished uh, was really having our regents set guiding principles. And, and it's very important to understand that these are guiding principles and that it's not a strategic plan, nor is it a vision for the university. Uh, Dr. Reyes and I were um, you know, very engaged in these conversations to say it's important for the regents to have guiding principles, but really the fundamental responsibility of establishing vision and strategic planning is based on shared governance you know, of the university. And I can tell you that I immensely respect shared governance, and that needs to be your work that bubbles to the top. And I can't wait to be able to you know, see this work surface in the spirit of innovation and in the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish across the University of Texas. Uh, Pedro Reyes and um, Dr. Nelson and Dr. Garcia have visited with SACS um, probably about six or seven weeks ago, Pedro, uh, to make sure that uh, Bell Whelan is, is up to date. In fact, I think Bell Whelan was here uh, not long ago. I'm particularly proud of the working groups uh, that you know, are now in process, working groups uh, that are reflective of faculty, students, and staff of both our wonderful universities here, you know, of, of, of our Brownsville campus and our Pan American campus. I know that hasn't been easy, and I'm sure that that first meeting was a little like, you know, who are you and why are we here and, you know, what work needs to be done. Uh, but I can tell you that I'm inspired by the progress uh, that I've been updated with uh, but even more important than that, I'm inspired by the fact that you understand that this is really important work and that you do have a real important opportunity to basically mold you know, the foundation of this new university. But you need to understand that I acknowledge that it's very hard work and, and, and it's not easy and uh, you know, I can feel you know, the burden on your backs because it's a compressed time period to try to do all this work such that we can enroll the first cohort of students in this new transformational endeavor by the fall of 2015. And at the same time, you know, working in parallel to educate the first cohort of medical students, the first MS1 students coming to the Rio Grande Valley in the South Texas School of Medicine in 2016. So be it well known, I know the hard work that you're doing and I'm eternally grateful you know for what you're doing because you know I can't do it uh, system can't do it this is the work that needs to be done here and emphasizing again the importance of shared governance um, we have um, we will be as you know we've embarked upon defining a search committee uh, for presenting to the Board of Regents uh, by the fall of 2014 candidates uh, to be uh, interviewed by the regents to ultimately get to you know the, the finalist. Uh, this is you know w w when I have conversations with Regent Andy Seda and uh, with the past chairman Powell and our current chairman Foster, they understand that the most important responsibility that our board has is to select the very best leader for this new university to benefit our faculty, students, and staff. So I am actually looking forward to the deliberations of the search committee, and I'm looking forward to um, th see you know what type of unbelievable candidates you know apply for this because it's going to recruit the candidates who are interested in this are going to be in, in a way pioneers um, in, in a sense of you know it's not going to be a comfort zone to begin with. And, and, you know, it's going to be an individual who has to be innovative, can be inclusive of this beautiful region and, and inspire people instead of vision uh, to move forward. So that has started. We had the first meeting last week. And I was, uh, we were very cognizant, the board was very cognizant about how this search committee had to be representative of the Rio Grande Valley and representative to the best of our abilities, you know, of our faculty, our staff and our students, and that's where governance, you know, became very important. But also to have community leaders, 
you know, who are representative of the region that we're trying to serve. We will be um, presenting to the Board of Regents uh, just three weeks from now, uh, basically uh, a request for allocation of funds to basically embark to the next stage of the work that needs to be done. So we need to have funds uh, to uh, basically, um, for, first of all, do the presidential search, uh, to be able to fund the advisory committees, to be able to fund for travel when necessary to go visit other universities uh, that could be innovative to the work at hand that you have, uh, and also some funds available uh, to bring in a master planner, not a master planner to take a to, to take a look at just one specific campus, but basically a master planner who 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 basically brings together the great work that has already been currently done in the master planning of Pan Am and Brownsville and the Regional Academic Health Center to take a look at all the assets that the University of Texas has, as well as um, you know potential sites. Uh, you know, for new growth that, uh, you know, counties and cities, you know, have, have contributed or are willing to consider contributions, you know, how does all this settle into this new university and how can we utilize our facilities uh, to the best of our abilities? Um, I was recently, I, I, time goes by so fast, but it might have been about seven weeks ago when I met um, here um, in Hidalgo County with uh, the county judge and, and a lot of elected officials, you know, where, you know, they conveyed their strong commitment about uh, allocating very important land that's contiguous to the Pan American campus and how that land could actually, you know, be utilized to impact the vision of this new university and, and also particularly, you know, the growth of the medical school. And at the same time, Cameron County, you know, is also through their economic development foundations determining what can they do also to contribute to this great university. So a lot of, you know, a lot of important work is being done by, by not only the faculty, but, you know, individuals who really care about this region in, in the private sector. And, and so again, you know, what a privilege to be able to have and embark upon these conversations. We also um, understand that uh, we did convey to you a while back that we would be in the process of of uh, bringing forth to the regents, um, you know, options in regards to their deliberations as to what the name should be, you know, for the new university. And so, uh, basically, where we are with that is that um, a list of suggestions, <laughs> far from any commitment, you know, suggestions that a working group uh, came together that, you know, I, I think it's somewhere between at least seven or nine options. I, I forget the exact number. Uh, these are suggestions, but also uh, what the plan is to basically bring forth these suggestions to Pan American, to our Brownsville campus, to the alumni, and to the community, such that you can add to these suggestions or you can comment on these suggestions. Like, you know, never in a million years will we want this named as such, or, you know, this is beginning to resonate with us. I mean, that's the type of feedback that we, as leaders, and in my, in my case, the privilege of being, you know, the CEO of the University of Texas System to bring forward to our board. And, and so our plans are to bring forth to the Board of Regents, you know, by the end of this year, recommendations and ultimately, you know, the governing board, you know, decides. Um, we are also um, in the process of, 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 the search, of, of the search committee for the founding dean of the School of Medicine. That's also, you know, very important work. So we've got a search for the founding president and a search that is for the founding dean of the School of Medicine. The latter search is a little bit ahead in the, in the sense that they've been at it a little bit longer. We just started the search committee for the president uh, last week. My understanding, uh, without getting into any specificity, is that, you know, candidates have surfaced that are really quite remarkable, you know, for the founding dean of the School of Medicine. And... Hopefully, uh, by the end of this year or early in 2014, you know, the, the finalist bubbles to the top and we can begin that process of, you know, bringing in the founding dean to start working with the entire of the the Valley, you know, to start the process of, you know, getting accreditation, you know, at least getting the 
preliminary accreditation pathways for a school of medicine. So, you know, I got to tell you, it's a little daunting. I mean, I know that you all are doing all the work, but, but from my perspective, uh, it's a little daunting as to what you and I and my team have to accomplish because we told our board we would do this. And, you know, one thing I've learned is boards hold you accountable. Uh, so, you know, they look at me every year. Did you accomplish your goals or not? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you think being chancellor is a comfort zone, far from it. Um, I also, in, 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 in discussions with uh, Robert and Julieta uh, and with the provosts, uh, it is clear, you know, from my perspective, that new facilities are going to be required, you know, for this new university. And, um, you know, we're going to need, if, if we want to bring in a cohort of medical students here by 2016, and if we want to have a prayer for, prelim for preliminary accreditation for the School of Medicine, they're going to ask to see, well, all right, you state that the first two years of medical school education will be predominantly in Hidalgo County, where's your facility? So uh, we will be presenting to the board uh, recommendations. Ultimately, I cannot speak for the board, and the board, by a governing body, as a group of nine voting regents, needs to determine is the compelling case strong enough. I hope I can make the compelling case. I think I can, but you know, uh, that, that's ultimately to our governing board. I also understand that if we are trying, you know, if our vision is to create a pathway for an emerging research university then we also need some facilities to complement the work that's being done on our Brownsville campus and our Pan American campus. Because there is, in our Brownsville campus, a shortage of space as a result of the unwinding of a UTB TSC partnership. And their enrollment actually grew by 1,000 students more than they expected, which is good news for UT Brownsville. But we have to basically help the Brownsville campus accommodate those students through an academic building. Now, you know, when I spoke to Robert Nelson when he first became president, he was really working hard for emphasizing the importance of a science building. You know, and, and that was his top priority for tuition revenue bonds. But if we are trying to get to a pathway of an emerging research university and we want to prepare our students to the fullest of their capacity, to go to medical school here if they so wish, then we need to provide the facilities to do and to educate students in a great science facility. So, um, you know, just out of, out of the top of my head, you know, I'm thinking of three critical facilities that are important in our pathway to what we're trying to accomplish. So um, I will be making recommendations to the Board of Regents at the appropriate time, you know, for these facilities, uh, understanding, again, the urgency in regards to getting preliminary accreditation for a medical school. So um, the work at hand is to try to get this done such that we can admit the first cohort of students, uh, undergraduate students in the fall of 2015, and the uh, first cohort of MS1s, otherwise known as first year medical students, uh, by 2016, and then do the important work that it takes to get accreditation. So um, that is the current update that, I, that I've got from a chancellor's perspective. I don't want to be pretentious and, and tell you that I know exactly what's going on with every working group, uh, because otherwise I would be micromanaging you all, and that's not good. Um, but I'm really looking forward to being debriefed, uh, you know, and I am being debriefed very regularly about the important work being done. So um, I've spoken enough. Um, this is an opportunity. I come down to the Valley to learn and to listen and to answer questions to my ability. So now uh, I'd like to be able to listen to you. And if you want to convey issues that you want me to listen to, that's fine. If you want to do that and ask a question, that's fine as well. So why don't we open it up? We have two microphones available. Please come down, line up. We have until 3.15. I will shut it off with the final question about 3.10. OK, so please come forward. Yes, sir. And, and if I could just, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, just let me know. Coming. 
You can scream. I get, I get screamed at all the time. That worked. That worked. Um, Javier Kipuro, some faculty member of mechanical engineering, also uh, a, a presidential fellow. So I just, uh, I just, on my way over here, I had some extra time, and I, I told, uh, um, I said, I want to stop by the engineering building. <laughs> so I visited your engineering building, and this coffee is from your building. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I can tell you I get around. Yeah. All right. You, you spoke of shared governance, and uh, we were very happy to hear that. One of the big questions that comes up from all these working groups is these recommendations we come up with, um, how will those be handled? What will be the process procedure? We, we understand that you know there's going to be a new president, and as much as many of us hope it's Dr. Nelson, we don't know who that's going to be. But the question we have in our mind is, as faculty and staff, we're the ones here, we're the soldiers, we're the ones doing the groundwork. These recommendations we come up with, is it just recommendation or will it, will it turn into something uh, more solidified, more you know, policy or what will, what will become yeah, of these recommendations? I, you know, the, the way I see this is that um, basically we, we've got to build a foundation to be prepared to matriculate the first students in the fall of 2015. Um, basically, the, the recommendations uh, that the faculty from Pan Am and Brownsville, you know, with the input of your respective presidents, you know, will we'll go to the Office of Academic Affairs. And then the Office of Academic Affairs, working with the leadership, you know, of the campuses, will help define, you know, the best, uh, in, in a sense, kind of handbook of operating procedures, in a sense, because, um, you know, there are regents rules and those are, you know, these are founding regents rules and, and those exist. And everything we come up with has to be aligned with regents rules. But the fact is, is that it's gonna be a hybrid approach in the sense that um, system, the, the Office of Academic Affairs my office will have to work with you and the leadership of the campuses to define those that can be enacted upon, you know, as soon as we can. The president of this new university you know, will actually have to adjust and refine as well. Because, I, you know, I'm not absolutely convinced that we can solve all this, you know, in, in just one process. It's, it's gonna be an evolution. But I wanted to emphasize the importance of shared governance more than twice today. Because ultimately, this is your university and administration has to work with the faculty to get to the right place. No. Well, it, it I can don't. hear you. You can hear me. Okay. I'm Wilson Ballard. I work with Compliance Support Services at, here at UT Pan American. And I have a concern about the coordination between uh, the work that we have to do with all this change here in the Valley and the uh, meshing of that with support from UT System. Um, we're used to being far away from UT system in, not in all ways, but in many ways. But we're Sometimes that's not a bad thing. Sometimes <laughs> that's not a bad thing. But those days are, are gonna be over because I think we're going to be, at least from my perspective, we will be um, the focus of flux and change in the whole system. Um, so, I have two examples. I'm not asking for a specific answer at this point. It's just a concern. But two specific examples is our guiding principles say we need to do partnerships with the community. We have very constraining solicitation and facilities use policies. Uh, re based repeat, repeat that again. We have very constraining facilities use and solicitation policies. Okay. They are based in solid principles that we can't line public, uh, private pockets with public resources. But they don't have to be written as constrained as they are, but we can't fix them from here. Those are the, those now, are is the this for example, issues. Is this, for example, if, uh, let's say, a private entity or foundation wants to have a program, you know, here, let's say, on the Pan American campus, and they need this auditorium, you know, can, can you let them utilize it, or do you have to rent it or lease it, that, that, that type of thing? That kind of thing? Well, that's the specific. Or if they want to charge any money at all, they have to give it all to us. That's not very conducive to partnerships. 
that's one. Okay, so, so, so one of the issues that, that our regents are, are you know, asking us, um, and it's part of the framework actually, is how do we develop better private-public relationships? And um, there's going to be an important task force that's going to be giving recommendations to the Board of Regents in November. It's not so much on compliance issues, but it's, you know, if we really want to excel in engineering, let's just use that as an example. And I, I just visited your wonderful engineering building and I actually got photographs of the little sand dune vehicles that I got into. Is, uh, it was hard to get out. <laughs> but, but, but part of that is even to fund important research in energy or in engineering, we can't have the federal government or the state solve all our problems. And so part of that funding is going to have to be public-private partnerships. And so we do need to change our conflict of interest. Uh, you know, we have to make, enhance our conflict of interest and conflict of commitment policies. But we also, in that process, have to also revisit all our, you know, intellectual property issues that come along. And the engineering task force is going to have a recommendation, I believe, that's ask, is going to be asking system to be revisiting these rules. So maybe that's shedding a little light to some of your concerns. The other aspect is, I shouldn't say this, but I also know who my audience is, is there's no campus, no region of Texas that I've visited more, you know, than, than the Rio Grande Valley because of the work at hand. So we are here, it's like the IRS, we're here to help. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Th th that's why you don't want us, you don't want us micromanaging you, but, but we, we care about this a lot, and I can, I can promise you this, that our Board of Regents, you know, is extremely interested, you know, and, and energetic in assuring the success of this university. And, you know, I also understand this is not easy work, and we're going to have some bumps in the road. Well, if the, if the working groups can call for alignment with system and system listens to that, I think we'll get where we need to go. Thank you. Chancellor, welcome back to well, Pan good Am, afternoon. our beautiful campus. And on a beautiful day. It's a chamber and, day. Yeah, we put in a requisition for that. Thank I'm you. Glad it got through. Um, my name's John Trant. I'm dean for the College of Science and Math. Um, I would like for you to share um, some input, certainly from other chancellors and presidents from across the country. Um, this sounds kind of like a softball question, not just the great opportunities. I think we have grasped that, but some, maybe some challenges and aspects that we really haven't thought about yet. Um, you have a few comments about okay, that. Okay, so, so um, first of all, we, we're all excited about, you know, the fact that we have an opportunity to innovate. But it's not like we're actually turning a new page, right? I mean, we have our past, we have our culture, we have our identity. And, and in a sense, you know, it would be a mistake if we just said we're turning a new page and, and this is an entirely new university. I mean, it's not. You know, we're, we're utilizing the great faculty and their intellectual capacity and, and the greatest research which we have is our students and staff in this community uh, to, to build upon this university. It's a new university in the sense that we're bringing together our assets, but the greatest asset of that is our human capital. I mean, you know, it's not buildings. Uh, we are basically doing this not just to do it, but it's for the greater good. I was talking to uh, Robert a little earlier today that, you know, mergers would be very hard to do. I mean, no merger is easy to do, but a merger that doesn't have a tangible benefit and you're just doing it to do it, I'd be really worried about that. What I'm seeing here is, you know, bringing in together two universities and their assets and their strengths to really be treated equally to our other UT system campuses. And it will be a glorious day for me. If the only thing I accomplished as Chancellor of the University of Texas System is to be able to bring resources 
that you otherwise didn't have, I feel as a human being, I've done something. And, and And if we can position ourselves competitively, because this is a competitive game. I mean, that is a challenge, right? I mean, yeah. you're, th this is not a game where you just ask and you get. I mean, th this is really, you know, a challenge is what can we do together to recruit the very best faculty and to be able to provide the best resources to benefit our students and our faculty? Yeah. Well, if we do this right, we're not only bringing resources that the board can allocate, but I've got great confidence in you. I always have and I always will. But if we do this right and we fall into the pathway of an emerging research university, and let's say two years from now, you become designated by the legislature as an emerging research university, I think you can, then suddenly you get additional resources like, you know, the TRIP funding, the Texas Research Incentive Plan, where the legislature provides funding for you that then matches philanthropic gifts in support of, of critical fields like science and math. You also uh, become eligible for the Competitive Knowledge Fund. And, and so suddenly, you know, now, now you are in a pathway of having access to resources you otherwise did not have. What is the challenge? The challenge is that, first of all, there's gonna be culture change because we're, we're morphing into something, you know, not that we're morphing into new campuses, but we're morphing into a new model. And with that comes culture change. Um, there's gonna be challenges of how do we actually make our faculty at Brownsville and our faculty at Pan Am feel united. I think that's gonna be a challenge. How do we do that? How does the president do that? How does the president share his or her time between the campuses such that both campuses feel they're a part of one. How do we come up with the resources for the technology to be able to basically interact better? Um, and then, you know, suddenly, if you're eligible for puff funds, okay, you know, higher education excellence funding sunsets, but you know, certainly right now, it's an advantage to be a part of the permanent university funds because of all the oil and gas shell play. And so we see that resource growing. But suddenly, you're gonna compete for that with you know, 14 other universities. And, and so it's a competitive environment. And if you want STARS funding, yeah. you know, STARS funding, you've gotta be able to kind of you know, pass a rigorous peer review process and system. So, you're going to be in a new model, but it's also going to be competitive. But I think that's what that's what that's good for us. And and finally, just on the good side for you, since you're in math and science, you know, I want to be able to bring that science building home for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. A most pleasant afternoon to you, Doctor. It's good to see you again. It is maybe, great to see maybe you Maybe we again. don't see you as often as we would like to <laughs> uh, from our end. And I want to thank you again for making the time to see us up in Austin. Some of our American GI Forum members went to visit with you. And thank you again for, for taking well, the time to see us. I'm going to interrupt you for just one second. And I want to salute you and all our veterans here for protecting our thank democracy. You. Thank you, sir. My name is Felix uh, M. Rodriguez, and I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I like to think that uh, we're pretty much act very, very active in the community here, and everybody here in the Rio Grande Valley and uh, north of the Rio Grande Valley supports our veterans. Uh, veterans. The effort that we have undertaken to realize a dream for us veterans, and that's the establishment and the creation of a veterans hospital here in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I applaud you, I applaud everybody that's behind this effort to, and it's, it's become a realization now, a real dream that's going to come to fruition, that we will have a merger of the, both campuses here, and a medical school as well. And I'll be, I'll shoot from the hip here, uh, Mr. San Chancellor, and that's that 
what is your take on the probability of us having a veterans hospital here in the valley when we an excuse that we were given in the past by the department of veterans affairs was that you won't you will never have a med a va hospital here in the valley because you don't have a medical school anywhere near well we know that that's so we just eliminated that argument, right? Pardon me? <laughs> scratch that argument off that list. The, the scratch that out, right? <laughs> we know for a fact that there are places in this country where there are VA hospitals and there is no medical school anywhere near within a 600, 700 mile radius. So that's an excuse, and we know that. But I'd like to ask you, and you've already answered this in the past to other American mm -hmm. GI Forum members that met with you. Uh, but I'd like to hear that from you here today. Okay, so... What is your take on that? Yeah, so, so uh, I've, I've always stated that uh, the veterans' health care system um, has been a fundamental, important entity for the education of future physicians, health care providers sure. in, in the United States of America. And, and in many ways, um, kind of the model... Uh, that I've been envisioning here, you know, for the School of Medicine is to have long and sustainable clinical partners. And in that comes hospital partners. And that's why it's so fundamentally important to develop, you know, primary teaching hospitals. And in my opinion, one of the great successes of the Health Science Center in San Antonio, you know, has been that the Veterans Healthcare Hospital was literally joined at the hip. You know, you, you don't have to go outside right. to go from the medical school to the Audie Murphy, you know, hospital in San Antonio. So my vision, you know, is similar to yours, you know, here in the Rio Grande Valley, is, you know, for us to be able to provide not only, you know, the very best health care for our veterans, because veterans deserve that, uh, just for, you know, the sacrifices that you've done to save our democracy, so I will always be an advocate for that. And as we conveyed each other in Austin that, you know, w we would advocate uh, to do our part to make that dream come true. Ultimately, our Board of Regents doesn't really control that. Um, I certainly, as Chancellor, you know, don't control, you know, the federal government. But I can promise you this, we would be great advocates. Thank you. That's, thank you so much. <laughs> We could we could stretch it out a little bit. Okay. We have time for two more <laughs> We have to clear the room and the students get to meet with the chancellor next. Uh, so and then we have to get two wheels up on the plane. So please. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Sharon Skimbury. I'm faculty in the business school in the Department of Marketing. I come to UTPA with industry and academic experience, especially with regards to branding and branding strategy. So I just found a great student for you at La Jolla High School. Did you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> she, because she wanted to know how we were going to come up with the name of the university. Yeah, good question. And, eh? and you know, what public relations and, and social media outlets are you going to use? Well, actually, my question is a step before that, because you mentioned that there's a working group who have put forward seven to nine options, and now you're going to put that out to the community to allow a voice there and come up with a decision before the end of the year. Well, and also to add to that list if, if, yeah. if necessary. Yeah, so we might add we're a few We're not more saying there. we have the answer yet. So my question is the step before what the high school student has asked, and that is, what analytical justification is being carried out for the branding strategy, the branding and the branding strategy that's being put forward? Okay, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't have all the answers for that one. Um, <laughs> I'm just a surgeon. <laughs> but, but, but I will say that, uh, you know, one of the first things we have to do is, is as a community, define the name for our university. And, and, and that we can't do in isolation. You know, I can't do it alone in my office. You know, we want the input of all of you. But I think once, once the Board of Regents, with the input that, you, that they receive from all of you, define a name, now you're able to actually begin to start developing a really good you know, marketing and branding strategy. And so 
I would have to basically, in order to, to be complete with your answer, I'd have to ask Rhonda Safety, you know, at System, uh, basically, what is their plan? But I think you know, part A is to get the name. Part B is we do we we have to find a budget for marketing and branding, and at first we're probably going to have to use a professional group to help us. Uh, but I think one of the most important things about branding is not just talk the talk, you got to walk the talk. And I think that part of that, one of the most important decisions will be, you know, when the board defines the name, when the board actually, you know, allocates funds for the vision that we have, and now you're building momentum, you've got wind underneath your wings, and now you've got a message to give. That's my surgeon's perspective, okay. but but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get professionals to help us with that. Okay, thank you. And here's one of our great heroes and representatives of the state of Texas that I had the honor of working with when I was president of the Health Science Center. Sir, it's great to see you again. Thank you. <clears throat> Chancellor Segaroa, you know. Uh, so we've, as you said before, we've worked together uh, on, on the project that uh, you are helping us get, a, get it to come about. Uh, and I want to thank you on behalf of the whole Rio Grande City and uh, Rio Grande City. I was thinking about Rio Grande City. Well, I did see my very first operation at Rio Grande City. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you and know, I, I had it. a little bit to do with the upper level uh, establishment in Rio Grande City. Uh, and I can foresee, in, in, uh, talking about a name for the university, I don't know who foresaw to put UT Pan American, but uh, the word American was put in there so that we could go ahead and, re and, and represent all of the Americas. Correct. Okay. So in my contention, and I'm one of the alums from uh, UT Pan American, both my BA degree and master's degree is from here and had I had given we had not uh, had this university here I would have never been able to get my education formal education so uh, I would strongly suggest that you all consider keeping UT Pan American in Bronzeville UT Pan American in Edinburgh UT Pan American in Rio Grande and you wouldn't have to change very much. So there we heard, we heard a message. <laughs> now, one of the things that, that, that I told uh, one of the students earlier today is that, um, you know, we, we, we talk about a new university, but, but it's so important for us, we can't forget our past, we can't forget our culture, we can't forget where we came from, and whatever ultimately the board decides has to reflect Part of that history, and it also has to reflect the fact that um, we are the university who's in, in the best geographic location uh, to, to really have an impact on the Americas. So, well, thank you. We'll see. We'll see what the board decides. Well, you know, and to close, we got a region uh, who just heard you right now. <laughs> uh, San Antonio wants to include us in being part of South Texas, and they're not. <laughs> Well, were you, were, were you in the legislature because, you know, the medical school in Santor used to be called the South Texas Medical School, and then it changed to UT Health Science here in Santor. I think you had something to do with that. <laughs> well, it, now, it's know, come to, uh, now, now I can figure it out. When, when they want us, uh, uh, they can use our uh, population, they, they include us. But then when it comes to help, then we're not part of South Texas. <laughs> So, uh, in reality, uh, on behalf of us, the real South Texas and the whole Rio Grande City and everybody present here today, I want to thank you for what you're doing because what you're doing is helping us get what we wanted and we worked on for together sooner rather than later. Thank you. Wow. Good afternoon. It's an honor to meet you, sir. My name is Robert Orozco. Good, wrong. Good afternoon, Robert. I'm an alumnus here from UTPA, graduated in 2012 and 2008, respectively, two master's degrees. And it is really deeply an honor to, to meet you. 
My, uh, my question is very humble. I'm just, uh, for a curiosity, my professor is going to test to have a very curious mind. I'm just wondering, uh, will the effect have any effect on the, uh, will the merger, I'm sorry, have any effect on the UT uh, School of Public Health programs in Brownsville? Well, the effect is that we want to enhance the School of Public Health. Um, well, first of all, when people ask me why in the world did I leave the daily life of surgery to become a chancellor, when people were telling me to run away from this job, I think they were right, I ignored them. But, but, but the reason why is, is that, you know, in my analysis of this is that education saves lives. And, and you heard Robert saying that. And in my mind, education is the greatest public health initiative that we can embark, you know, not only here in the United States, but in the world. I believe that, that by, by creating a school of medicine, that's the beginning of creating a comprehensive academic health center. And part of a comprehensive academic health center is a vibrant school of public health. And so I only see that growing. And what a great environment for public health initiatives in the Rio Grande Valley. And, and I do believe, you know, we, it, it's a relatively small school of public health, and, and it is a it is a, you know, its governance is through the UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, but when I take a look at the School of Public Health in Brownsville, it has brought in more grants uh, and more, you know, a lot of scholarly contributions than, you know, many of the other campuses under the School of Public Health in Houston. So in my mind, um, you know, if I were president, and I'm not going to be president, but if I were, I would keep focused on the impact of public health, not only for the academic health center, but for the new university. Thank you, sir.